kind of, I'm just going to start. And I hope I remember it all. The, uh, so in terms of kind of the bigger picture, in terms of climate science, there's a, there's a lot of science behind kind of what, per, what produces greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the things that is really clear is that buildings produce uh, tw about 20% of the world's greenhouse gases. So that's buildings, infrastructure, residents, and, um, uh, and you know, facilities and, and things like that. So, 20% uh, of the greenhouse gases in the world, which is really, uh, really a, a big number. Uh, a big portion of that is actually from indirect uh, GHDs, uh, which come from the, the amount of electricity that the buildings use themselves. So uh, not only uh, do the buildings make up a huge percentage, but a huge percentage of that is what, uh, how much GHDs are released when we're making the energy that we use all the time. Um, so you can see kind of why um, energy efficiency seems to, is a really you know, key tool in reducing the amount of energy that we use. So this is the graphic for that, for what I just said. So you can kind of see that the, the slashed lines are um, from indirect emissions and the solid ones are from the ones that actually come from the building. So you can see that the difference is almost double. Uh, just in case you're wondering, blue is residential and um, yellow is, uh, I believe, what, commercial. So especially in commercial, you can see that the electricity produces more than the building itself, but it's still counted within as the, the use of the building. Um, so energy efficiency. The way I always think about it is reduce, reuse, and recycle. We usually apply that to waste management, um, but it, same thing applies here. If you're going to manage your energy, the first thing you want to do is reduce the amount that you use. Uh, so that would be energy efficiency. The second thing that you want to do is rethink the, the, what you're using in the first place and see if there's a way you can reuse it. And, and I always think about this as like solar or uh, generating your own energy or anything like that. And then recycle and that's uh, what are the emissions of the actual power plants and you know how do we deal with the consequences of what we actually do have to use. <clears throat> uh, and one of the reasons again why this is so important is a building is a structure that stays there for decades. So anything that you do, any, any changes that you implement or don't implement will affect the future long term. So uh, if you that this is always my, my thinking for in, in implementing them today as opposed to tomorrow or the next day. Uh, because if you, not doing that has the exact, has, has a lasting effect just as though reducing it today does. Um, because buildings are so long lasting. Um, what I came across which I thought was really interesting is that uh, this issue is, is you know, identified as important by world uh, world, uh, the World Business Council of Sustainable Development <coughs> specifically, um, they, they want to create net zero energy buildings by uh, 2050, all of them. So you can see how ambitious this goal is, but also how necessary it is moving forward. Uh, in terms of, uh, so, you know, we can tell it's important, but what, what, why, you know, why? Uh, and w some of the common things you hear in terms of energy efficiency, save money, reduce greenhouse gases, and increase your building stock. Make the, the building a, a better, uh, more stronger quality. But what does that really actually mean? Um, so I found this really interesting chart that I just wanted to show you guys. Again, it's from the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, and they did some research as to, like, as to the actual impacts. So not only is it... Um, how save money, but what, what does that actually mean? They broke it down a little bit further than save money. Um, there's an increased employment impact, so there's more employment. Uh, increased energy security, in increased productivity, uh, uh, increased uh, value of the building, and increased disaster resilience, all of which are important things. Again, they broke down the um, reduced greenhouse gases, which basically amounts to indoor and outdoor pollution, air quality increases. Um, and then the final one is what does, uh, what does building better buildings mean? What is the social implications of that? And um, my favorite one from this slide is the thermal comfort. So you, you make your building better, more comfortable, a better place to be in. But if you attended the last workshop, you'll, you'll know that I'm very much um, how does that affect me? Whether or not that that's selfish, I don't know yet. But um, So in terms of a community league, what does that mean for a community league? What are the benefits for you? 
Um, saving money means that you have more money for the things that you do every day for programming, events, activities. Um, Potentially, even you know, you could hire a staff to manage the building if and reduce volunteer burden. Um, those are the kind of things that those money that money allows. It gives you um, so for some from something as simple as energy efficiency measures. Uh, and then you know, save greenhouse gas emissions. It means a healthier, sa healthier, safer, cleaner community, and that's all community leagues want, um, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, increase lifespan of the building. What does that actually mean? It means a better, more comfortable building um, for the community. Uh, also something that came out of last, uh, last week is the language that we use in order to talk to our board or our members or you know, for the people who aren't quite as sustainability minded. Um, so that's why I kind of made up this slide, just in terms of uh, what energy efficiency can be spoken about in any of these terms? Building maintenance, building upkeep, building uh, renovations, updating the building, better quality tech or better technology. That's all that energy efficiency is. It falls under all of these categories, um, which I always think is a very interesting. Everyone understands the benefits of these things. You say this, people understand this. Um, but energy efficiency can be something a little bit scary or bigger than, than it needs to be. So that's all I wanted to say as kind of the intro and the big picture as to why. So now I'm just going to introduce Brandon. Um, like I said, he has done nine audits on different community league buildings across the city. So he kind of has a baseline as to what goes on in community league buildings. Thanks for having me here tonight. Um, thanks for the intro, Charlotte. Uh, she said, my name is Brandon. I'm um, partner with uh, Generate Energy. Uh, I started it with a, a colleague of mine named Jeremy, who's uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't be here tonight. So um, I'm going to steal his show. So we are we were hired last year uh, by the Green League's uh, board to be the consultant for energy uh, auditing on the leagues. Uh, we we perform commercial and farm energy assessments. Uh, we also we also are a solar company. So we design and install solar PV as well. Um, so we believe uh, that, that there's, a, there's a necessary approach to renewables and it has to include energy efficiency because uh, we feel that we need to provide a holistic approach for our customers in that maybe the thing that they need isn't solar, maybe the thing that they need is, is uh, to reduce their energy usage. Um, solar isn't for everybody. Not everyone has the perfect place to, to mount solar. Uh, but everyone has the opportunity to reduce their energy usage. So that was kind of the foundation for our business. So I have a lot of information to go over tonight. So if you have any questions, just feel free to pop your hand up. I'm pretty easy with uh, uh, my presenting. Uh, if you have questions and they're burning, just throw your hand up. So we're going to talk about uh, energy efficiency and the Alberta context, uh, why it's important here, um, dovetailing with some of the things that Charlotte said, um, steps to implementing energy efficiency in your league, um, energy use in buildings and some metrics that we use to measure uh, energy efficiency um, or energy use in general. <coughs> uh, an energy audit or an energy assessment, uh, synonymous terms. Uh, energy saving opportunities by different systems within your building. And then question and answer. So what is energy efficiency? Energy efficiency is being able to use less energy to perform the same function. That's the, that's the essence of, of what it means. Um, so we see, we've seen that constantly. Technology is driven by, by efficiency. So the wheel is, is, a, is a prime example. Um, uh, this uh, picture uh, to, my, to my left is, is the, the first electronic computer ever in invented. And, uh, and it, it now fits on a microchip that's smaller than your fingernail. It's the... The, the compu this computer now uh, in, this, in this form is 350,000 times less, uh, uses 350,000 times less energy than it did back in 1943. So uh, technology and this century, the, the, this century and the last century were, are, are driven by, by efficiency and uh, energy efficiency. Yeah, there we go. So it's technology driven. So how do we save energy? Um, two ways, uh, basic ways, if you really want to uh, uh, simplify it. There's behavioral change, which is free and it's low cost. It's turning down your, 
your thermostats manually at night, um, and uh, it may compromise your, your comfort or your convenience. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to manually shut your lights off, uh, which, is, which is a normal thing that we do. But it's a behavioral change, and it's a way that we reduce energy usage, and it doesn't cost us anything except maybe our time. Uh, then there's a technological change, which would be actually improving a piece of, equi uh, a piece of equipment's efficiency. So replacing your furnace, for example, with a condensing furnace. Uh, that's, that's a technological change. Or upgrading, upgrading your lights. Instead of flicking your light on and off, you have, I just installed one for my boys in their bathroom, uh, a censored light. So that you come in, light comes on, and it goes off automatically when you leave. So you, you really take the... The, uh, the human element out of it, I guess. And you're sure that those lights are going to be on only when they need to be. An example of this uh, when we were doing our training is, is they, they say when, you, when you're talking to, like, say, a larger institution maybe where they have cleaning staff that comes in at night, you know, uh, it's always a good point to start talking with them. What do you find left on when you come to work? Because they're coming to work and they'll find TVs on and, you know, all this kind of thing. That's a behavioral change that's real simple. All it is is training. You talk to them for you know a half an hour and say, "Listen, your job now entails shutting these things off when you start work, and then for the evening, that then they don't have to do anything. It's it's just it's just a behavioral change on the part of a different person, right? So, anyway, yeah. So why is energy efficiency important? The triple bottom line: it saves money, it's it has environmental benefits, and improves the health and well-being of people. So there, th these are these are things that are important to. There's, there's new organizations being developed called B Corps where the triple bottom line has to matter to them. It's not just making profit. Uh, it, it's about these other, these other P's as well, profit, planet, and people. So corporations that are, that are uh, operate under this manner, they, they, they find these things valuable. And these things are valuable in, uh, when, when you're talking about energy efficiency because this is what, what you're really doing. It might, be, it might seem small and insignificant, but but uh, um, if everybody you know, gets on board like, uh, uh, like we see in the community leagues here, it, it really can make a difference. What's the, what's the term for that new kind of business model? A B Corp? A B Corp. B Corp, yeah. Okay. Yeah. A benefit corp. A benefit Yeah. Yeah. So it has, it's in there, it's actually in their, um, um, their, their code of ethics and their operating that they have to, they have to uh, look out for these, these things. <coughs> in their business plan. Um, so uh, Enercan did a study here in, on Alberta and what effect an energy efficiency program would have. This is prior to us having our energy efficiency program because last year when I did this talk, they didn't. It was in the works. Uh, but they, their study predicted that we would have $50 million in energy uh, $510 million in energy savings, a uh, $550 million growth in gross domestic product, and 3,000 jobs created as well as the equivalent of 9,000 cars off the road. So uh, there's major um, room for improvement here. And Enercan is, is, uh, is, is one uh, organization that, that really is helpful for us. We, we use them often, and, and um, uh, they, they see the value in this. And, uh, and I'm glad that we do here in Alberta now as well. Why is energy efficiency important? This is the uh, cost abatement curve. So. Um, energy efficiency improvements have a negative have an impact immediately so lighting insulation retrofits um, motor system efficiencies these are all these are all things that have a financial benefit immediately and a carbon reduction benefit immediately uh, whereas you see things like solar solar PV they have they have an energy payback period right that has to be overcome before they start uh, actually reducing the carbon and they do over their lifetime but but they're above this line. So financially and environmentally, energy efficiency is, is number one. This is from a study that you can get online. Uh, if you look this up online, uh, McKinsey and Company, they did this. And it's, this is just a graph from their, from their study. It's really interesting. So Alberta and significance. There's, a, there's an untapped opportunity here. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of buildings that were built to uh, a really low standard. And there's a lot of older buildings here that, that have uh, a lot of old technology in them, really easy wins. Uh, we call it fruit so low that you're walking on it. <laughs> so we, we got lots of that happening here in Alberta. There's 645 million pledged for uh, um, energy efficiency programs from the government over the next five years. 
uh, was planned. Uh, the carbon levy came into effect, carbon levy, not carbon tax, because levy indicates that it goes, it doesn't go into general revenue. It, it is dedicated and earmarked directly for energy efficiency programs, for, for uh, renewable energy programs and uh, green, green infrastructure. Um, so um, you can correct people when they call it a carbon tax and it, and it actually does make an effect because that money is going, we're, we're seeing the fruit of it right now. On the solar side, I've seen it all summer where people are actually getting their solar systems installed, getting a check in the mail and it's really encouraging the growth of solar uh, as well with energy efficiency. Alberta, they have programs for residential energy efficiency and commercial as well. So uh, we're seeing this go to work right now. And, and, and I would wager it hasn't really affected people's lives as much as, as some have led on. Uh, uh, in my case, I, I, don't th I don't see it. Uh, NECB 2011, so this is a new building code that came out. The National Energy Board uh, released new requirements for buildings commercial and residential. So they have to be built to a, a higher standard energy-wise. Uh, they have to have a much tighter envelope. They, they, have, to, uh, they have to incorporate the, right the correct levels of insulation. Uh, and they have, to, they have to be measured against the, the business as usual model and they have to show significant improvement on that. So that's another thing that's really helping us out here in Alberta. This is just, uh, this is just something from our website, a little snip. Uh, these are all the programs that are available right now for energy efficiency, for solar, um, and, and energy management. So a lot of this wasn't even here last year when we were having this meeting. So I, I just wanted to point that out, that a lot of these, lot of these programs have, if they were there, they were, the funding was small, but they've, they've all drastically changed. So this is just our website. We've got them linked, if you're ever interested. I just want to see, we're, we're doing a good job here. We're coming along. Energy Efficiency Alberta. Uh, it's too bad David can be here tonight. But uh, he, he's always, I really like listening to David Dodge. If you ever get a chance to, to see him or hear him speak, he's, uh, he's awesome. Um, but again, they have, these, they have these programs available for you at home. Uh, a lot of them are, are, you can go just to your Home Depot. I'm sure you guys have seen, you can get, I think they just launched a new, a new program here recently. Uh, you can get uh, programmable thermostats, LED lights cheap, uh, pr um, uh, power bars. They have all kinds of specials on these things that, that can really help you reduce your energy uses at home. Um, and then for the business, they have a business uh, program as well uh, where, they, where they fund a certain amount of, of your upgrade costs. So th there's no reason not to, not to dive in. So becoming a green league, what, is, what does that really mean uh, for, for you guys? Um, we've we've uh, really enjoyed working with all of the representatives who went through the program last year. There's some who... Um, um, who went through it there later in the year. We had another presentation in January last year. But they, it really is a process, and, and we get to work with, with, the, uh, with the members who, uh, who go through this process with us. And uh, we grill them about how often their uh, center is used, because usage has such a really high impact on the energy usage of a building. Um, we, we found some that are that are that are barely scarcely used and huge buildings, but they, they have a very a very small amount of energy usage comparatively. We found small buildings that have huge energy usage, but it's it's all based on the occupancy and how much people use the space. So uh, I think as as a rule, we want community leagues to be used. That's what they're for, right? So uh, sometimes you, we'll show some metrics here. I'll show you later. Of, of leagues that, that weren't used, but their building is huge, so it's, it's not being utilized to its, it doesn't mean it's efficient, it just means it's not being used. So that's, uh, these, are, these are kind of factors that we can uh, think about. Anyway, so uh, an energy transition ambassador is someone who can communicate this importance of energy efficiency to their board, A, like we said, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get people on the board on board. So that's something that, that you, uh, you will, you will need to kind of get the right language like we were talking about. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, some people's, uh, uh, sometimes aesthetics is something to, to open with, but then, but then finish with, you know, remember when we were in that meeting last week and that room was so hot, or, you know, we, we, uh, you can go around and, and have a tour of the building and just point out some things. So that's what I'm hoping to do here today is to show you a few things that, you know, that are obvious that, that maybe will help people on your board realize that, yeah, maybe we need to, to have an energy assessment done or, or, or look at our building a little bit deeper. So you want to involve key individuals, so the facility manager, hall managers for occupancies, and, and to know how often this building is being used, how it's being used, if people are, um, 
um, you know, leaving lights on, if they're turning the thermostats down when they leave, are they leaving doors open while they're there? These are important things, uh, behavioral things that can really affect energy use. Um, and involving the treasurer is a, is a real big thing. The power bills and the, the gas bills usually come to the treasurer, in our experience anyway, not all, uh, and then they get paid and then they get filed. And nobody even looks at the numbers because it's kind of hard to really understand what a gigajoule is and what a kilowatt hour is. Uh, most treasurers we found uh, don't really, uh, you know, have a handle on exactly uh, what's good, what's bad, right? We've we found one league, uh, I believe it was Grosvenor. They had they had an outrageous water bill, two thousand dollars over the over a couple of months, and it was because of a leaking toilet. But if you would have looked at the bill, you would have seen that uh, or been tracking it uh, on a program that I'll talk about later called Energy Star Portfolio Manager, where you, all you got to do is enter the bill every month into that and it'll tell you, it'll show you a graph of, of where this sits and, and they would have caught that. Somebody would have went down there and said there's probably a leaking toilet somewhere and uh, it took two months to find and it cost them dearly, <laughs> you know, in billing. So um, that's where the treasurer needs to be involved uh, and, and maybe it's something that, that you as an ambassador will come in and, and take the bills and enter this and, and have a look at and I'll be a second eye for this kind of thing. Uh, and then involve your community. Uh, home energy toolkits are available. I know in St. Albert they just got some at the public library there and I know they have them at Edmonton as well uh, to help people do a little home energy audit on their home uh, and find some areas uh, that they can improve energy uh, efficiency in their home. How much time do I have, Charlotte? When are we taking a break? Um, 30 minutes. Okay. So. That's a really good point about the treasurer, by the way. It's funny because our treasurer, we, not, we had an audit done of our hall and our house, and it didn't include the scope, didn't include to look at our, our rinks. And the oh. treasurer said, you know, we should really look at the lights on the rinks because they're sucking so much energy. And yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he was the one that identified the opportunity to go LED on our, on our, wow. on our rinks. So, yeah, involving that treasurer in the picture. Right. Everybody's so isolated in their roles that nobody really puts that big picture together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, does anybody deal with the, with the energy bills for their league? Land of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. I'll just I'll just ask a question. So, um, sorry, I don't like these slides. I'm just gonna hop through here. Um, so su to success, uh, this is the, what the Green Leagues is trying to trying to do. Uh, to, to, to start start right, make a plan. So begin with an energy audit uh, of your building. So you can identify what, what areas are worthwhile spending time and money on. Um, and so, some, it, it's difficult because often you'll, you can bring in contractors to do these things, but they have their self-interest and they're going to obviously sway towards the things that, uh, that they want to sell you. So what we do is come in and offer an objective look uh, and, and an auditor should come in and offer an objective look at, at your building as a whole. We start, with, we start with your billing and we identify, we can identify things, I'll show you as we go through here, just by looking at your bills uh, and learn a little bit about your building without even seeing it. So uh, making a plan is, is the first thing. Uh, you know, get your projects in order, things that you'd like to do. Um, make your efficiency upgrades and make sure that you're doing your maintenance too. As I'll show you here, maintenance is, plays a key role in energy efficiency. Uh, reduce your operating times and, and implement some controls. So, you know, put some programmable thermostats so that you can, you can effectively control the heat in your building without having to be there every minute of the waking day or, or, or making sure that someone else is doing it. You know, there's apps, there's, there's uh, remote access right now with smart thermostats where you can just quickly control and check what, what temperature is my league at right now. Uh, it shouldn't be there because there's nobody there, we can bring it down. So those are things, uh, optimizing your efficiency on, on the high use equipment. So uh, hot water tanks, furnaces, uh, and any, any other um, equipment that you, that you might have. Um, lots of refrigerators we find, lots of uh, chest freezers. Uh, the efficiency in these things has come uh, uh, a long way. So monitor energy use. This is the next thing. Is this as simple as looking at your bills every month? making a, an Excel spreadsheet where you can 
graph it, or by using this portfolio manager, which I can uh, share with you. Uh, we set up each of the leagues with portfolio manager. When we get their bills, we enter them into this, and then we set up an account, and we give you the information. So it's all there. You have whatever bills you've given us, we, we give you them already entered into this portfolio manager, and then all you have to do is maintain it. Every month, just continue to enter your bills, your water, your gas, and your, and your electricity. And then a regular review with your board. Are we meeting our goals? Uh, you know, we've, we've implemented this whole plan uh, and are we meeting them? Maybe we need to adjust. Maybe there's something that changed. Why, uh, why are we not meeting our goals? Did our occupancy go up or, or do we need to look at uh, some further retrofits? Yeah, well, if you got bills from the past, you got benchmark data. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah, so that's what we do. That's, uh, we're going to talk about benchmarking here. And so how far back do you go? We typically go two years. If we can get two years of, of billing, that's great. We need at least a year, mm -hmm. but two years is great because it gives us, it kind of helps uh, um, with some of the you know, anomalies that might happen. At least if we have two years to look at, we can say, well, it was just a cold winter. Or we know kind of the months in the past two years which were cold and and uh, yeah, or, or, or whatnot, and two years helps, yeah. 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 Is this, is this uh, portfolio manager applicable for domestic use as well? Yeah, I do my house, yeah. My house is on there and I, I, I put it in every month and it helps me kind of, uh, I don't have, uh, that, that's my monitoring, yeah, at this point, and it works great, yeah. Just, just a quick check and it's just, as you're paying your bills, you just open up that website and type in a couple numbers and you're done. So another thing that is interesting is a, a dashboard. Um, I know, I think Evansdale is setting one up, uh, I believe. They have a solar array, they have an awesome solar array on their roof, um, but they've also got, they've also got uh, some energy uh, monitoring equipment. So they've got submeters, they're called, that go into the electrical panel. And, in the, and, and they're actually able to tell, uh, they, they, have, they have monitoring system on there that will tell how much the solar uh, is producing and also how much their whole building is using in general. So they're able to look uh, at any given time and see how much energy their building is using um, online in real time. So what this is, uh, this is from uh, uh, a university in the States where they've got 70, I believe 73 buildings or something like that on campus, and they've got them all connected and they have a, they kind of, St. Lawrence University, sorry, it's right there. They, and they have like a, a little bit of a competition every year as to, as to what dorm and, and what area can reduce their energy uses over a week, you know. And so what does it take for the Rainleaf program to get this solution to start competing with each other? Right? Yeah, so we just need some energy monitoring. They're, they're, I think we've already talked about it a little bit. Uh, so it's in the works? Yeah, we've got, we've got some, we, we've got the ability to, to do it. I mean, it, it just, uh, the um, this is, would be electrically anyway, which is which is a real good start, uh, and and it, it requires these these energy meters to be installed in the electrical panel, and then it just hooks up to the Wi-Fi or the internet, whatever is available, uh, whatever you have available, and then you can monitor your energy use online. It's really unique because uh, you should have a baseline. You know, when when the building's not occupied, you should have a baseline because there's a good chunk of time these league buildings are not occupied. So you should know that with everything off everything on idle, all of the, the furnaces turned down, this should be your baseline. This is where it should be. It might come up and down with the furnaces operating every now and then, but you should know, right? And then if anything's off, if you're using more than that, you know something left was left on, right? You, you, so, so you're able to go down there and you know, shut those lights off or turn, uh, turn the popcorn machine off or whatever it is, right? So it's just, it's just a, a really quick way of, of uh, a snapshot of knowing what your building's using. And, and they use this as a competition. And competition is actually the, they've done studies on, on what drives energy efficiency, and it's competition. If you, can, if you can see that they're better than we are, and I want to be better than them, and, and there's a visual way to do that, that that's what drives uh, the changes in energy efficiency, major changes. We have a megawatt how cool is that? Yeah, that's it, the megawatt, how much you can save. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. That's the same thing. And yeah, so we could have a megawatt challenge. 
uh, we didn't help him with that. They were already in the works. Gordon was doing it for them. So, yeah, we were hoping he'd get in earlier so we could use the data for our audit, but he didn't get it in time. So, but we got it now. Yeah, and then it also shows like you know uh, you could have it set up in your in the front lobby, and it can show uh, tips for people who are who are in your league that sh that show how your dedication to it and and help them in their own home. Right, things that real simple things that people don't know. Okay, so I have two community leagues here, uh, League A and League B. So I can tell, just by looking at this, I can tell already what's unique about them. There's, this one has 13% electricity use, uh, and the rest of the energy use is natural gas. Um, and the energy cost is about 37 and 63. So this is a, this is kind of, uh, typical um, for a league. This can also be typical for a league, but there's something different about this league. I don't know if anyone can guess. It has it has more. Uh, well, no, it, it might not actually. Not? That, no, that's not what I'm going for. It's more about the equipment that's in the building that I can tell. This one's got older equipment, maybe. So, so B has more energy efficient services? B has more, yeah, that's, you're on the right track. Heat. Electric heat. Oh. Yeah. So this one has a significant more amount of the energy use uh, being electric, being electricity. So it might not always be indicative of that, but I can tell that you know when we see a league that has that has a good percentage of energy usage uh, of their annual energy uses being electricity, that they have electric heat. And electric heat is four to five times more expensive than natural gas. Well, it sure shows the cost. There you go, right? Yeah. So you can tell right now. That, that 13 percent uh, of use, but uh, of, of, of yeah. So 13 There you go. So that's that, that indicates the difference, right? So electricity, if you can get rid of electric heat uh, or reduce it, that's, yeah. So, so this is what I mean by just a bill analysis. We can kind of say, OK, I bet you we're going to find electric heat in this building. <coughs> so uh, utility bills, uh, confusing, confusing, confusing. So they make it confusing. So that it's hard for us to understand. Nmax is one of the worst. They're so confusing. But so energy usage. If you look at your your electricity bill lately, even at home, you'll notice you'll notice something that 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 it's very lopsided. The the electricity cost, what you actually pay for electricity, is is a is very small compared to what you pay for distribution and transmission charges. It's about it's about you know seventy percent of your bill is distribution and transmission charges. Right, uh, but it's all based on your energy usage. So if you use less energy, you're you're lowering the cost of your distribution and your transmission charges. So uh, you might like pay twenty dollars for your for your electricity, but that's not that's not all of it. So when we do our audit, we what we do is we look at this and we say, you know, every kilowatt hour that every every kilowatt hour that we reduce of your usage. It actually isn't just the three cents of energy that you're paying for kilowatt hour. It's actually the whole thing, right? You're reducing your distribution costs as well. So all rolled in, that's like 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's more expensive than it you let on. And and this is a this has changed recently because of the way that they've they've put in a whole bunch of new dis uh, transmission infrastructure, and and they they leveraged all the ratepayers to do that. So they said we got all these ratepayers. Look at and we want to do this project, look it. So let's just get them to pay for it, and they can make the payments on it. So that's what's happening right now. So that's why our transmission distribution is so high. But all the more reason to reduce our, our, our energy usage, because it's all based on that. So if you're using 30%, you know, if you're using 30% less electricity, then it's, it's lowering, it's not only lowering uh, your energy usage, which is the smallest portion, it's your distribution and transmission. Uh, charges as well, delivery charges and local access fees. So all of these things are all based on your energy usage. So they, they look at that number. So it, it, it costs you more than, than the three cents that your bill tells you. And, and, and again, not, not many people know that. So same with water. Uh, water usage. 
uh, you have water charges, direct water charges, and then there's wastewater treatment because you pay drainage, right? Uh, wastewater and then drainage fees. Sorry, pardon me, they're two different things. Uh, we found in, in, a, in a lot of leagues that have, um, that have rinks, outdoor rinks. Uh, how many have outdoor rinks at their league? Yeah, almost everybody. So uh, some leagues will have a separate meter for it. And it'll be a, a larger meter, a larger uh, diameter um, um, service. So those, if they're set up properly, they shouldn't have any. They shouldn't be charging you drainage or wastewater because that just goes into the ground, right? So you sh you're not, they're not actually being. There's not. There's not actually any uh, cost incurred to the city for that water being put out. It's actually just going into the ground. So we found leagues where they were using their indoor water to flood the rink, and then they were getting charged uh, all of the wastewater and drainage fees, but they but it doesn't actually go through the system, right? So this is where we just do a bill analysis and we can say, listen, this is, a, this is what you should do. You should get another meter installed that's just for your ice rink so that that's only used during the winter time. You might pay a little more. We, we would find that, that even though they would pay more to have another meter there, they'd still save like $600 a year. So, yeah, it was substantial. Yeah, so this is benchmarking. Uh, this is essentially what it is here. Uh, the Prius uses, you know, it can do 45 miles a gallon, and and uh, our our friend here, the Hummer, is about is about nine or ten. So comparing energy performance, we do it all the time with vehicles, but it's kind of awkward to talk about it by buildings because the units. What's a gigajoule? Um, so this is how we do it in Canada. Uh, it's, it's gigajoules per meter squared. So electricity, kilowatt hours can be converted into gigajoules, they're, they're energy. They're the same, they're different. Uh, we always talk about electricity in the form of kilowatt hours, but it can be converted into gigajoules just like your gas. So that's what we do is we take, we, we crunch all those numbers, we take the electricity and the gas and we smash them together and we get a gigajoule number for your building and then we take your area, all the conditioned area. So if you have three floors, it's all the, the square footage of all those floors. And we take the, ga the, the energy and we divide it by the meter squared and we get this value. So then we have, we have another uh, dollars per meter squared. So how much your energy costs you per meter squared. So normalizing it to, to uh, a meter squared so that we can compare buildings, right? Uh, so again, benchmarking is motivating because uh, are you better than me or, or how are we doing uh, between our buildings? Energy Star Portfolio Manager is something that we talked about uh, kind of already. I don't want to get on it too much. I'm going to touch on it one more time. Um, you can't manage what you don't measure. So this is where knowing these things, knowing your metric, knowing where you stand, uh, you know, it's, it's like going on a diet. You want to know how much you weigh and where you want to get to. So uh, you want to know where we are with, with your energy usage. Energy Star Portfolio Manager is a tool to do that. It, it helps you constantly monitor that and it will update these values for you regularly. As you enter your bills, it will change your value. Uh, your your uh, energy utilization index is what, what this number is. But you can't manage it if you don't know where you're at. So you got to know where you're at. Um, so a question for you. Which building uses the most energy per square meter? I have a prize too. Oh my. Uh -oh. This is a kilowatt. You guys can measure heard those. You heard of those? Yeah, this, is, this will help you measure your appliances and stuff. You can plug in and you can see how much power they're using. Yeah, so. Ooh. Lots to go. I Ellie. might be, I might have an egg. Okay, go ahead. Hmm, I'm torn between B and E. But I'm leaning towards uh, B. B? Yeah. Should we try? Careful. Uh, I'd say it is. It is? Yeah. yeah. I'll try. So they have a they have a really high energy intensity. Yeah. Um, so why should you do an energy audit? Maybe you got the Tin Man here, the old furnace. Uh, or your lighting is old, or you got old windows. Um, how, how do you know which one has the most financial feasibility, right? Uh, that, that's what Energy Audit is, is really good at identifying. We identify the cost associated with the upgrade 
and the energy savings, the potential energy savings that, that could result from, uh, from upgrading a system. So that's where it really has value in that it legitimizes, you know, it's not just, ah, I think we should change these out, probably going to save us money. It's actually, th these are the metrics, uh, this is the cost, and it's a really concrete way of, of approaching things. And, and when you're going to a board, often they're skeptics, but if you have some, uh, a report that shows exactly and lays out, you know, here's our, our billing is, is proving that we have a higher than average. Uh, that's something that I forgot to mention is that we, we measure you to other community leagues, but we also measure you to other buildings throughout Canada, uh, sorry, within Edmonton that we can find. It's good to do region specific because you've got to share the same climate, right, to, to, to get a real accurate picture of where you're standing. So the more people do this, the more you add your buildings into Energy Star, the better metrics we have, right? So as you, know, as you get more, more information, better averages result, right? So um, Energy Star does that as well. They have numbers for a community center or a social hall, social meeting hall. So we compare you that, that way as well to see, you can see how you stand. Um, so that's what an energy audit is really good at, prioritizing uh, energy efficiency upgrades. Sometimes things don't work out. Sometimes we've found that like the furnaces are not, uh, they're, they're like an 80% efficient furnace, but they have such low gas usage that, that it's, they, they're controlling it really well, maybe through like manually therm with thermostats, that it's, it's hard to, you know, you know, the savings they're realizing uh, they're not going to be, they're not going to pay off the furnace in 20 years, you know, but it's a reality. Maybe they can get the furnace funded. That's another thing, right? Maybe you can get the whole cost of the upgrade funded. That's then your then your paybacks are there, right? But uh, we do all of our calculations based on the no assumption of no funding, so that you're at the most conservative uh, numbers that you're going to have. So energy uh, audits, uh, we re commonly refer to them energy assessments now. This is an older energy au audit. Just ew, brings a chill, right, to people. So, <laughs> hey, and it's and it's not we're we're not uh, we're not auditing as much as we're assessing, right? So I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to help you, not not gouge you. So, um, so yeah, two to three years of energy bills. Uh, we already talked a little bit about what we do there. So we do a site visit. So we survey the building. This is really interesting. This is at uh, uh, one of the U of A's buildings, actually. Uh, it this is a pizza oven that they had on in the kitchen for this uh, for this one recreation center, and they'd leave this thing on. We'd spend some time there. They'd leave this thing on all day. They come in at 10 and they flick it on, and it was like 4,000 watts. This thing was electric. Yeah, and it would, and we seen like two pizzas maybe in the, like we spent about a week there, uh, we seen like two pizzas come out of that place. And that, that's on all the time. Electric heat, right? Like real electric heat. So uh, this is where a behavior thing like we suggested, you know, maybe turn it on just before you start a pizza or something like that, you know? These are, these are things you can, that you can do. Anyway, we, we identify them through our site visit. Uh, we do analysis and research, so we, we talk to contractors. We have a pretty good database of, of costs of things right now uh, in the market, and uh, then, we, then we develop a detailed report. Uh, sometimes we actually contact, uh, uh, I know Ridgewood, we had, they had a big dimmer. They had a huge dimmer uh, system for their lights, because they have a beautiful hall, like a wedding hall, and they had these massive pendant lights that they would want to dim, you know, for you know the, the first dance or whatever. But the the dimmer pack wouldn't work with the LEDs, they because you have to actually change your dimmers like you do at home. It's the same concept, but we actually had to get in contact with the manufacturer and and discuss with them the viability of changing the out to LEDs. And uh, yeah, it didn't it didn't make any sense in the end because the costs would have been really high. They would have had to actually replace this this unit. So they we, we contact we know we're in contact with the board and we say like listen this is the this is what's happening. Do you still want to go ahead with this in the report this recommendation even though it's going to have a really long payback? Um, and they said no, we're fine with the lights the way they are at this point until we can get some better technology in there. So anyway, that's the kind of research that we do. Uh, and then we present your findings. So Charlotte will come usually, and we we sit with the board, or we don't like to sit with the whole board because often there's opens us up to a, to a lot of people who uh, maybe didn't know this was happening at all, or don't have a whole lot of background in it. We find it's more poignant if we sit down with you and maybe another interested uh, board member and just display, you know, our results, and you guys can take some notes and then take it back to your board. Uh, and then it's um, and then then it gives you guys a chance to to you know, get a, get a foothold and kind of explain uh, why this is important. Yeah, we can take a quick break. Uh, are we close here?
Yeah, just this one slide and then I'll take a break. So this is the results. These are like what we give you. Uh, this is the, the meat of the report. We get uh, the baseline uh, through the billing um, and through our interviews um, with, uh, with, with you and with uh, you know, the facility managers. Uh, and then we develop energy conservation measures. So this is one uh, where we recommended installing smart thermostats to control the facility. Uh, so that saves natural gas because your furnace isn't operating uh, as much. We're able to set the thermostats back when the occupancy isn't there and you uh, reduce the natural gas being used because it, has, it doesn't have to be held to such a high temperature all the time. You reduce your electricity because your blower fans aren't running uh, regularly. And if you have four or five furnaces, which is typical of these leagues, then that's substantial. And they often pay back very quickly. So um, again, $2,400, that's professional installing these as well. So uh, if you have someone who's savvy in your league, uh, we, we can do that as well. Uh, and note that it'll be a volunteer installing, so the cost rocks will be lower. So like I said, we try and pick conservative numbers so that, uh, so that we're safe. So yeah, and that's how we display it. So it's real simple to understand. So this is our, our bike. Um, does somebody want to try and ride it? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah. good. I just went to my cardiologist last week. I think I'm okay. <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah. We've got uh, to <laughs> sign something, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so this is meant to help you identify the difference. You have to go a little faster, though. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. There. Okay, there we go. Okay. A bit of tension now. Okay, so that's, a, that's an incandescent light. So that's equivalent to roughly a 60 watt light bulb, 54 watts. So could you do that for 18 hours? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even think I can that would do be, 18 minutes. That would, be, <laughs> that would be one kilowatt hour. Wow. If you kept that lit at that brightness for 18 hours, that's one kilowatt hour. Holy smokes. So think about that when your solar array is pumping out one yeah. kilowatt hour. Today it was just <laughs> going, I bet. Yeah. All of our systems were working great today, nice and cold. Okay, so, so now that's an LED. So you got to go a little bit faster to get over the base load. There you go. But that's the oh same brightness. God. Holy smokes. Yeah. So <laughs> that helps that helps kind of get the understanding of what it's energy, right? But I don't get it. So 18 is, is because of 18 hours 18 times 60 equals like 1000, so that's not a kilowatt change. hour is uh, is a is a kilowatt of power for 1 hour. Okay. So power is a rate, right? Like okay. just like a 60 watt, that's a rate. It uses 60 watts. Um of power every second, right? Every every time that it's uh, as a, so that's how you get energy is 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 the power, the rate times the time. Yeah. So energy saving opportunities. So we have a few levers that we pull uh, when when going through um, and looking for energy saving opportunities. So recommissioning. So that would be something like getting your furnace tuned up properly so it's operating efficiently. Uh, controls and set points of your thermostat. Uh, behavioral, which we've talked about ad nauseum here. Um, efficiency upgrades to your furnaces, your air conditioning units, your hot water tanks, uh, straight unit uh, uh, upgrades, and then maintenance. Things like cleaning your filters um, and cleaning the uh, condensers on your uh, air conditioning units, for example. Oh, here's a perfect example. Yep, so this is, this is out of a league. Um, this thing was running, we logged it, we have loggers uh, that, that we use and we logged it and it was running 70% of the time over a two week period. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, this had partially to do with it that the condenser was actually plugged. So a, f a refrigerator works as a refrigerant system. So it needs to cool the refrigerant so that it can actively cool the, the fridge. And if it can't cool, those fins are plugged, then, then it just continues to pump and the compressor stays on. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we actually suggested replacing this one uh, that at, with an Energy Star rated uh, fridge, and it saved them 65% uh, on on that operating that, that uh, refrigerator. Um, so these are large furnaces, uh, air handling units. They have air conditioning built in as well, but uh, this is their thermostat. Uh, but we found we logged them as well. Uh, we have we have little tiny loggers. Here I can show because they're kind of fun, neat. Um, and we put them in the furnaces. Uh, we don't do this every time, but we do it uh, sporadically if we think there's a, an opportunity. But uh, these little guys, they they monitor. You put it on a motor, 
So uh, you don't even have to hook it up to anything. It recognizes the magnetic field that's created on the motor, and it'll turn on and start to log. So we put it on the motors, on the furnace motors, and whenever they run, it'll log the time that, that, that it sensed that field created. And then we can export it to Excel and do all kinds of fun stuff with it. So yeah, so anyway, um, that helps us because we need to know how often things run. These things ran constantly for a two week period, nonstop. So we did the math on that, and uh, that's about 14,000 kilowatt hours a year. A house, just to give you some, some uh, comparison, uh, your normal home, a normal uh, Canadian home uses 7,200 kilowatt hours a year. 7,200, a whole house. So over a year, just these two units, just the fans in these two units would have used 14,000 kilowatt hours a year. So yeah, very, very expensive. Uh, so, um, and this was just a control thing. Apparently when we had the meeting with the board, we recommended that they, you know, uh, uh, they had a good thermostat. They had it there. They just wasn't programmed properly. So we recommended that they program it properly. Uh, and they said that they've had major issues. Uh, it's sometimes you don't talk to the right person until you're at the meeting. But uh, they said that, yeah, they've had issues where HVAC companies have come in and tried to rewire their control systems. And, and this is the last time it was set up and nobody did anything about it. They, they thought it was running properly. But um, it wasn't. So uh, something that we found, yeah, and they were... Um, just a simple fix that uh, that uh, they needed to dig into, and we were able to like w with w where we uh, projected it should have been around it should have been less than half of that it should have been it should have been under seven thousand kilowatt hours a year so that's a substantial savings. Um, boilers uh, sometimes we have leagues that have boilers and they have uh, um, heating units throughout the you know a lower level or or upstairs. Um, this boiler we measured it we actually have a, a combustion analyzer. So we turn it on and we stick this thing in the exhaust pipe and we, we measure how efficient the combustion is by measuring certain parameters, certain chemicals that are, that are left in the exhaust. And we can tell uh, this unit had, was, was rated at 80%, but it was actually operating at 60% uh, efficiency. So we recommended that they replace it with a 97% efficient boiler, uh, new boilers, um, that actually have an outdoor sensor that can sense the outdoor temperature and, 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 it, and it helps them operate very, very efficiently uh, by knowing the, out, the outdoor temperature as well. Um, so it can adjust quickly for changes in weather um, and it's not struggling to catch up when by the time all of that cold gets inside, um, then, it has to, then it has to run constantly to catch up. It can, it can anticipate. Um, and then programmable thermostats as well uh, to be able to you know, set that temperature down when there's nobody there bring it down to you know, f three or four degrees uh, when, when there's nobody occupying it. And often, this was a church in the basement, so they would be there once during the week, and then you know, to maybe two times on the weekend, a, a high occupancy, but a like, good portion of the year, it's not being used, but it was set at, at 21 degrees constantly. So that, that's a, that was a significant energy savings we found there. Um, this is an, a really easy one, a common one. AC lines, uh, not all leagues have AC, but we found many of them that do, they have uh, inadequate insulation around, uh, around their uh, low pressure lines. So these low pressure lines, the reason that they're insulated is th because uh, they are going inside your building to take the heat out, right? They go in and they get exposed to the hot air, the hot air gets blown over a coil, they go through a, like a little radiator like in your car, and the hot air goes over them and they absorb that hot air and they take it back outside and, and, uh, and the condenser, the fan, blows it off as, as waste heat. But if they are not insulated, then they're absorbing the heat from around them. So if it's plus 30 outside, all these lines are absorbing heat all the way inside. So they've, they've, they've are almost saturated with heat by the time they get into your building. Hmm. So having good insulation on those is key to make sure that that line stays cold and it can get into the building and then extract the heat where it needs to, not, not a, absorbing heat from the outside. So uh, this is something that you know, your maintenance guy can probably do himself. We recommend using a, a, a closed foam, uh, a closed cell uh, foam and then having a wrap around it because birds love to just pick away at this stuff and the sun, but if you, if you use a PVC jacket on it, then it really protects it really nice. Uh, and anyway, the, the, the point of that is that it really increases the energy use of your AC unit. Uh, the motor, the compressor has to run longer to provide the same amount of cooling as if, uh, uh, 
to, to keep up uh, rather than if these were if these were totally uh, insulated uh, it would have to run way less to provide the same amount of cooling um, so we do IR thermography uh, at night is usually the best time to go um, you can see so this was a this was interesting this isn't the actual the this is, isn't the door but this door was uh, uh, it was like a patio door and it was a single pane of glass and it had the weather seal was actually like was torn and hanging in the door right so it was it was keeping the door kind of cracked a little bit but look at the heat it we thought that there was something else up here but it was actually just the heat uh, filtering out through underneath the uh, there's a wood paneling underneath here but like that's happening all winter long right uh, and this was like an upper mezzanine so all of the heat congregated up there uh, and it just escaped, right? Because that was the that was the, the exit point. So that's a major temperature difference, minus 22 to, to you know just about zero. Um, so that that was uh, you know again we recommended them replacing that door because it was a single pane and the frame was really poor. Um, um, but uh, you know even if they would have just re replaced that ceiling and made made a good seal, it would have saved a, a lot of of uh, waste heat. Um, and then door closures as well. I don't know if anyone's got rinks. We, we, we spend some time there on the weekends sometimes, uh, the leagues, and you know, kids go in and out, door goes open and it stays open and it stays open and it stays open, and there's no door closers on, on a lot of these because you know, maybe kids are hardening them or whatever when they're playing hockey, but a door closer that when it opens, it shuts immediately. Simple thing, but it keeps the door from staying open for maybe you know, few, three, four hours at a time. So <coughs> we're gonna go through systems uh, briefly here um, that we look at. So 15 to 30 percent of energy use in commercial facilities is is lighting. Um, it's the first area of focus um, because of the technology right now. Um, we have really efficient products that can do the same thing as the inefficient products, which is a really unique place to be at, where lighting uh, and for a, a very similar cost. You know, three four years ago, this was not as easy. It was there was still there was still um, uh, justification for LED lighting, but it was harder to swallow because of the cost. But now the cost has come down so much um, that we have r we have really short paybacks, yeah, and you have funding, mm -hmm. yeah, which is not something that we've we've traditionally had in Alberta. So, um, so there's there's a few approaches as well. A lot of a lot of buildings we find are actually overlit. Um, there's there's ratings for for how much they call it a foot candle which is the light that falls on the paper. Like how much light you can actually see is, is the foot candles. Uh, and sometimes spaces that are overlit, can actu you can actually get rid of certain lights because, because when they were designed, they were, they were overlit. Uh, improve the lighting efficiency, which means replacing the bulbs uh, and sometimes the ballasts when in, if we're talking fluorescent lights. Uh, we try and curtail the operating hours, reduce as much as we can. So by putting in, um, um, occupancy sensors, for example, in bathrooms, so the lights aren't left on all the time, and then take advantage of daylighting. So, like in this space, if we get if we get enough light during the day, uh, we can actually put in an occupancy sensor that doubles as a daylight sensor. So, if the lights are, if somebody's not in here, the lights are off, and if there's enough daylight, the lights will go off. Simple things, technology that that allows you to to you know um, make sure that that the light the lighting is appropriate and that it's efficient. So switching your incandescence to uh, now, I wouldn't even say CFLs. People are changing out their CFLs with with LEDs because there's there's still a case to be made for that. Uh, exit signs is a big one. Why why do you think exit signs are so crucial? What's unique about exit signs? That's right, 24/7. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we found leagues that will have. You can actually get these LED bulbs that will fit in an exit sign. You can take the, 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 the I think they're A6s, you can take them out and you can put LED bulbs in there. Yet, we, there's still a case to be made for actually changing the whole fixture out to an LED, LED, LED exit sign because they use, they use about half of what the LED bulbs would use. So they use around two watts. Uh, so over the lifetime, that's a long time, right? So they, they do pay back. Um, you want to get those numbers as low as possible. Um, exit signs are often the first thing we look at. They're a real easy win. Um, the other thing is that you have to replace the bulbs regularly, right? If they're incandescents, you're replacing them at least once a year. 
So uh, an LED will, will last, you know, 25,000 hours. So you can install it and forget about it, essentially. Uh, but we're switching uh, T12 fluorescence. So T12 is this one here. It's larger. Um, switching them to, to these guys, uh, or sorry, uh, the T8s. But the T8s uh, are now LEDs. You can get LED tubes. So all it is, is it's identical to, to the fluorescent tube, but it's just a strip of LEDs strung inside the tube uh, on, on, a, on a small board uh, that gets strung inside, and they provide the same amount of, of light as a fluorescent. The only thing that you have to do, uh, depending on uh, the style that you had, if you had these T12s in, installed before, you have to change the ballasts to electronic ballasts, they're called. And we explain all that in our, in our audit. Uh, again, we talked about sensors, occupancy, and daylight sensors. You can get these, um, you know, Home Depot, Rona, Lowe's. They have all these things, uh, and they really work. Uh, lighting control is key. Um, behavioral, like again, I talked about, you know, cleaners or anybody who comes in, say, after weddings, uh, whoever the hall manager is, you know, obviously making sure that they're shutting lights off and they're making sure that things are uh, on idle mode for your, for your league. Um, these are things that we kind of look at. This is my partner, Jeremy, uh, business partner. We've... We, he had a lighting retrofit that he did, and I think it's an interesting story because it's, uh, it's pretty simple. He, 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 changed all the, he bought his house and he changed all the lights out for LED. This is when they were still expensive. Uh, uh, his, he, it cost him $265 to change it all. Uh, his, his annual savings are $124 and paybacks in two years. So if he wanted a better investment, he would have to go out and find a mutual fund that would pay him 50% per year. So, so there's financial uh, um, power in, in, in energy efficiency, not, not just uh, the carbon savings like we've been talking about. <coughs> so can you exactly go into that kind of detail, like including like those like motion detecting and light detecting monitors and where they can be sourced and that kind of thing? Yeah, to the to yeah, we we'll say if it's you know if you can find them, you can find them at like a local hardware store, mm -hmm. which would be yeah, yeah we go. We go into, uh, we have an implementation section, which kind of outlines, you know, if it's a, if it's a tall light, uh, we'll, we'll say you need a 12 foot ladder or something, you know, wow. we'll kind of, cool. yeah, just try and help, help make it as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. So low cost opportunities in, in heating, ventilation, air conditioning is what that term is. So poor maintenance, uh, like we talked about already, a dirty coil versus a clean coil, like an air conditioning unit. Uh, the airflow just can't get through. That increases your fan use, fan energy usage. If the fan can't push through something, a filter or a coil, then its energy use goes up. And you have to use, uh, your air conditioning unit will have to run longer to provide the same amount of cooling that a clean, fil that a, that a clean coil would. So you're, you're going up on, on two respects there, just by maintenance alone, right? Um, it's not operating as it should. Uh, this is something that uh, I found in my house. I have an older home, and the vents, they don't stick into the, they're, they're not, they're not um, secured. So you have waste heat. You have heat that's going out into a, an unoccupied zone or a plenum, right? Say in your roof. Sometimes you have uh, the heating vents up in, in the plenum, so in between the ceiling and the roof. Uh, and air leakage in there is, is wasted air because it's not an occupied zone. You want that air to come into where the zone is occupied. We found one leak that had, that had underfloor heating. Um, sorry, their ducting was run underground, underneath the subfloor, and it was just dirt underneath. They had like a crawl space area, but all of the ducting was uninsulated. So we went down there and it was like 23 degrees below the floor. But upstairs it was like 16, and it was th this type of cinder block walls. It was hard, it was, it was cool in there, and it would constantly be cool, but you go onto the floor and there's just all of this heat because all of the, the furnaces all ran underneath. And ASHRAE, which is the, the, the governing body for, for uh, HVAC design, they, they recommend that all of this, anything run under a subfloor is insulated, right, to, to make sure that that heat is going where it's supposed to go, not where it's not supposed to go, right? So anyway, interesting things we find. Get a smart thermostat. These things are great. Um, they can, again, they, they know the weather even now, so uh, I'm not sure if Nest does it, but I know Ecobee does it, where they'll, they'll know the weather, and it's, they'll know that it's going to change, so they'll, they'll start bringing your heating system online a little bit, so that your house, by the time that that cold actually gets to the thermostat in your house, your whole house is cold, 
right? And then your furnace has got to run to catch up. This knows that, and it'll say, oh, it, the temperature's dropping outside, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn the, the for, even though we're at, we're still at the set point, I'll, I'll bring it up every now and then just to make sure we maintain that temperature. So, they have really cool things now like uh, vents, uh, you know, like your registers that you have in your floor. You can take them and you can put ones that communicate with the thermostat. So like your, your, your living room, you don't, you're not in there at night, right? So, uh, um, so y you don't need to really heat that space at night. So these will actually communicate and they'll shut those vents off at night and then just keep the ones in the, in the bedroom operating. So it's called zone control, right? So you, you, you reduce the amount of space that your furnace has to heat. And then they have remote temperature sensors so they know, you know your room will have a temperature sensor and your kid's room will have a temperature sensor. They'll make sure that those rooms are warm where they, when they need to be, right? So it's really optimizing your heating system. Here's another, this is an example exactly what I was talking about, zoned heating. Uh, these are units you can put in your duct that will do the same thing. They'll shut off the vent going to your living room or your basement when there's nobody in there and just heat the areas that you want to be heated. Uh, these are larger, uh, talking about larger upgrades. Um, so variable speed fan motors. Uh, a fan, as, it, as you increase the, the, the speed of a fan, so most people's furnaces, the fans will run at one speed. When you turn it on, it just goes and you hear it in your bed at night when you're sleeping and it's loud. And uh, modern furnaces have the ability to vary that. So they can bring it up to... Uh, uh, a low, medium, or a high setting, depending on the amount of heat demand. And it's exponential, the amount of energy that a fan uses as the speed increases. So if it's only running, if it's only running at uh, 10%, uh, then the power can, or sorry, if it's running at 50% uh, of its rated RPM, then it's only using just over 10% of the power. But yet, if it's running at 90 or 100, then, then it's, it's using a, a uh, you know, closer to 90 or 100% of its of its rated power. So there's real value in in keeping that fan speed low, uh, and keeping uh, maybe running a little bit longer, but keeping the fan speed low. So um, again, modern furnaces, uh, condensing furnaces, usually have a variable speed motor. <coughs> and uh, upgrading to more efficient model, obviously, uh, that that will convert more of your natural gas into usable heat. Um, condensing furnaces will take the heat that comes off of the exhaust and they will harvest that heat. Old furnaces would just send it up the chimney. New furnaces will take it and they will, they will extract the heat that's left in the exhaust after it gets burnt and, and use that to, to, to heat your home. Uh, and, and that's why you'll have, when you do that, water, it, it condenses, right? Because you're taking so much of the heat out that you actually have condensation forming because uh, that, then, then that's why you have to have the pumps and you know a line running to a drain outside. So there's a little bit more infrastructure that needs to go in when we put these in, but it's worth it in, in the long run. So domestic hot water, um, the Marion Center uh, is a soup kitchen downtown here, and they actually install a drain water heat recovery system, which is really cool. They have a lot of hot water usage because they're a soup kitchen. Um, so uh, what it does is uh, it will heat this line here is the, this is the line coming in from the city. This is the drain line. So uh, all the soup and all the dishwashing that they, uh, that they do goes down their drain pipe and it heats this coil. So this coil is all of the incoming water from the city. It gets preheated before it goes into the hot water tank. So it's using the, the water that's going down the drain and it's extracting the heat that's left in that hot water going out to the sewer and it's preheating this water so this hot water tank doesn't have to run half as often. So it's reusing that heat, it's not wasting. Uh, this needs a really high amount of water usage to, be, to make financial sense, but it does make sense. Uh, solar thermal systems where you're actually using the heat from the sun. Uh, car wash, when it's hot outside, when the sun is out, what do you want to do? I'm going to go wash your car, right? So car washes are, are one thing that's, that's actually finding a really uh, economic use for solar hot water systems. Uh, and then gas over electric heating, obviously, which we talked about. We don't have a, a lot of electric heaters. Uh, it's not as common, I would say, for electric hot water heaters here. You still buy them because they're the cheapest thing out there, but they're not if you look at the economics of running them. The operation, it's four times to five times more expensive to operate than a natural gas 
um, hot water tank. Uh, and then insulating your pipes. This is a real simple thing that everyone can do. Insulating any visible pipes, uh, hot water pipes from in your league. That's something that we recommend that uh, because you get a you'll get you'll get a convection current happening where the water will come up, cool, because the pipes are exposed to air, go back down, and then the hot water tank has to kick on. And the majority of the hot water use in the league is from this, is from the waste heat that happens. Yeah. Because there's not showers and not heavy loads typically uh, on a regular basis. Um, so plug loads, uh, Energy Star rated appliances, they use a lot less energy. Uh, since if you have a fridge that predates 1990, good idea to replace it. Uh, the technology changed massively in the compressors and how they and how energy efficient they are. The DOE in the states funded almost all of that. They pushed through a lot of new technology in, in appliances because everyone's got appliances. There's such a huge part of the load of the grid. Um, so, so this has really made a big change. So Energy Star rated. Energy Star again, it's the same the same portfolio manager. It's the same organization that we're talking about here. So um, building envelope, we look at the roof insulation. We try and control the solar uh, and internal gains. We want to keep as much of that heat inside the building in the winter. And uh, you want to have um, the ability to, um, uh, uh, you know, building envelope is, is not something that we, we constantly are recommending because often it, it has a, a high capital cost. But some cases where, uh, like in Langes' case, we recommended that they replace the, they upgrade the insulation in the roof and they were uh, able to, I think, um, and uh, that has a major effect. We were able to do some IR on the roof and see the cold spots actually visibly with the camera, so that that's can have a real positive effect. Um, here's some IR uh, again with uh, windows and doors and uh, the heat leakage. Weather stripping is a big one. Um, triple pane windows uh, is harder to come by in a commercial space. You need to have metal frames. PVC frames aren't okay in a, in a pr commercial building. Uh, by the building code, we've seen them, but it's not something that you should be doing. Um, um, but if you are going, look for the low emissivity windows uh, and uh, uh, double or triple pane. Triple pane being the best. Single pane is, is really terrible and you'll definitely be, uh, if we see that, we'll definitely recommend placing those. Uh, water conservation, again, uh, this is real simple. Aerators, uh, we'll recommend them often. They're $20 and they save both hot water and water, actually, water charges. So you're using less domestic hot water and you're using less water in general. So there's a double, double reason to replace those. And then they have some real fancy, uh, look for the water sense label when you're doing them. Uh, it meets the criteria of uh, EPA and, and it, it certifies it. Uh, toilets as well, they have, they have toilets rated for that as well. Hopefully that this was helpful to you and uh, informative and I would definitely, um, yeah, reach out to me. I have my, some cards here I can give you. If you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. And All right. Uh, again, my name is Langes. I'm from the Burnwood uh, community, Southeast uh, Edmonton. Thank you again, Charlotte, for the invite. So what we did is last year, I attended those workshops last fall and got really excited about the information we receive and uh, not so excited about all the work we had to do, but nonetheless, <laughs> we persisted. So number one here, I put attend all the workshops that provided by EFCL. Tons of information will be offered to you in the next several weeks and very valuable information. Number two, once you, you have attended the workshops, uh, EFCL provide, you know, consultant to have energy and solar assessment to be done. So that is up to you as what you want to do. Do you want to do only energy assessment or energy and solar and take it from there? Number three, prioritize. Do you go ahead with the energy assessment recommendation? All of them, only some of them. Again, it boils down to money and you know finance, and or solar assessment recommendation. Uh, whatever you do, choose a reputable and reliable contractors. These are dime a dozen contractors out there, but believe me, they're not all reliable nor reputable. We had one fellow coming here for the uh, energy retrofit, the electrical part of it, literally with a clipboard took five minutes and he was done. Well, I said, what, what have you looked at here? You haven't gone in the basement, you haven't looked at the ECM that we suggested to you. So you gotta be very diligent as who to use. However, as of I do believe last year, Nora here, I can't remember her last name. Uh, but yeah, as a data bank now on reliable contractors for Community League on the EFCL website. 
So it would make a huge difference. And you'd be very surprised in the recommendation we received from Brandon, electrically speaking only, we had a difference of almost AGs for the same job, apples for apples. Same, you know, how would you call it, um, goods being used and so on and so forth. So there's a huge variation out there. You would believe in this time of recession or semi-recession would be a lot competitive. It is not. So you have to be shopping around and get at least three quotes per merchant. For example, three HVAC if HVAC is involved, three electrical, three insulation, and so on and so forth. All right, next step is, uh, and that's intended to be, call it a framework as an ABCDE process for any community league who choose to venture into that. Number five, I guess, is call an AGM. Our own bylaw Burnwood, we have a maximum of 5Gs that you can spend without calling an AGM. Well, use this to say when you get involved in HVAC, electrical, and solutions, it's going to be way above 5,000. So you need an AGM, and I'll link it up in the other bullet coming up. Funding. Uh, there are several sources of funding available. We discussed CLIP earlier, that's the City of Edmonton, Community League Infrastructure Program. You got CFEP, that is provincial. CFEP is Community F Facility Enhancements Program. You got the TAME Plus program that uh, we mentioned earlier, taking action to manage energy. So the bottom line, any of those uh, agencies that you apply for, you have to have a very detailed application of what you, you wish to accomplish. No details, no money. Nobody's going to turn on 50 Gs to you without asking you what you're going to do exactly, how you're going to do it. So the report, for example, Brandon provided to us extremely comprehensive. You call them ECM, if I'm not mistaken, right? And I, I think we had 18 of them or something like that. So we choose out of 18 to implement 16. So whenever you apply for funding, they want to know that. What would you exactly implement? Have you gone out? Have you received quotes? And so on and so forth. They want to know those details before they provide funding to you. Uh, so you had your AGM. You community league approved the expenditures you're about to do. You have applied for your money. You have heard from some. Some, like CLIP, is usually a no-brainer. CLIP will give you the money based on, I think it's 25, 15, 100,000. So let's say last year you received 100,000 from CLIP. This year you will only receive 25,000. However, other like CFIP want, need to know a lot more information. So is Thane. They want to know the details exactly. The estimate they will ask you to receive to give them the estimate that you obtain via your contractor that you have chosen and so on and so forth. Now, the contractor has, you know, allegedly finished the work, do a walkthrough. Go to 1 to 10 or A to F as what was done and how it was done. Because at the end of the day, you pay the bill, right? You want to make sure that you get bill for what they were expected to do. Retain your invoices and financial payment for each provider. Uh, the invoice is not a payment. The invoice is the merchant telling you you owe them money. Tame, for example, will not release the money on, until you paid the invoice and you got your financial statement from the bank that the check was cash for, let's say, for example, uh, Joe Blow Welding Limited. So they're very specific as what they want to obtain at the end. So again, you have to retain your financial statement. And at the end, celebrate the completion of your project. So we started last year. We got the uh, Brandon's report by what, early January, if I'm not mistaken, late January. And uh, we went to our EGM in March. And from our EGM, we uh, had several quotes uh, given to us. Then we hired our contractor. And we had the last one completing the installation about a month ago. So it was almost, well, yeah, a year process for us to, to, to complete. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Any questions? Super awesome. What, 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 is, your lead, what is your board position? Uh, my, my position? I'm VP, yeah, but I do maintenance, like any boards. You do a little bit of everything. Okay. So yeah, theoretically speaking, I'm VP, but I do and a lot more. What was the specific motion that you, how did you position it to the board? Did you say, like, I want this much money to cover. Like, how, yeah, what was this? Do you remember this? Specific yeah, I do have it on uh, our minutes. Uh, what I shot it and Brendan mentioned earlier, I have to do legwork for that because 
we always had a little bit of resistance among some board members and I had to set it as, listen, down the road we're going to need those upkeep, the new furnaces and so on and so forth. So it's on, it wasn't only under the energy umbrella, it was you pay now or you pay later, but either way you're going to pay. And when your furnace breaks down middle of the winter, there won't be any grant available to you. You need it right now, you're going to pay the full price and guess what? You won't get any subsidy for that. So you have to work with the human factor, so to speak, to... Well, th that was my approach because I was encountering a little resistance here for some board member. I bet, oh yeah, it's all notly program, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay. So how do I present it to them in a way that they're going to be more receptive? And by using, like, our hall is 35 years old. One furnace was 25 years old. Well, the life expectancy is 25 years. You've done well. Any, anything above that would be a bonus. Lights were the hockey ring lights, for example, were mercury halide of the early 80s. So whenever you started them, you had that ballast that would go on for about 10 minutes, and eventually you got some lights. But the power bill was just enormous. See? Again, 80s technology. So by using the upkeep versus any energy efficiencies, I was able to, I guess, I think the board accepted. Yeah. Well, I think you did very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.